All right, so welcome back to Unit 5, Section 2. We're going to get into chemical communication. I would probably just call this pheromones for the most part because we're going to talk mostly about pheromones, not entirely, but for the most part, that's what most chemical communication is. We can make this a very detailed section, but we're going to try to hit the high points to this and move along with it. We've already talked about this to some extent, but remember a pheromone is a chemical that's produced by an organism tries to convey information to other members, usually of the same species. They're usually conspecific. This is different from a hormone. A hormone gets produced in your body in a gland, like a pituitary gland, adrenal gland, somewhere like that. And then it travels to another part of your body and is trying to communicate with that other part of the body to get a response in whatever way. It could be a behavior. It could be something with the... You know, something needs to be produced or done, whatever. But hormones are within the body. Pheromones are from one person or one entity to another individual. Usually gives a behavioral development or physiological response. It can be transmitted through air, water, direct contact, even ingestion as well. There are two types of pheromones you need to be familiar with. The first of, and so you should be able to identify these. Like given some criteria, you should be able to do this. Uh, primate pheromones, are, uh, well, signaling pheromones are first. Small, highly volatile, usually go through the air. They elicit a behavioral response. They tend to be pretty much immediate. This can be sex attractants, aggression, fear, territory, recognition, trail marking. All of these are signaling pheromones. Priming pheromones tend to be larger, as in a larger molecule, and they are very tactile, so touch-based. Physiological or developmental effect on the recipient. This can cause things with development. This can help regulate reproduction. This is puberty, estrus, things like that. So priming pheromones that you see there um, as well. We've talked about some of these to some extent. I want to do a few different examples of these really quick and make sure that you know what these are. So for example, in bees, the queen is the only reproducer. I'm sure most of you already know that, which she actually emits pheromones that the workers spread throughout the nest and that actually suppresses the ovaries of the worker bees. Because remember, most bees are actually female, contrary to that bee movie. Um, and it actually induces the workers to work as well. Now, if the pheromones go down we know the queen is in decline maybe she died or got removed um, got killed or something the workers will start the pheromones go down the workers will then change behavior as a result of this and construct a queen cell which will allow a new queen to emerge and take over the hive so my question to you is this what type of pheromone is that is that a priming or is that a signaling it's priming that's a priming pheromone okay Let's look at another example. This is a queen butterfly. The male transfers transfers pheromones, um, danadins, to the female. I'm not probably mispronouncing them, but danadins only come from milkweed plants, and the female will incorporate the danadins into the eggs, and this actually deters predators from eating the eggs. The females will usually pick the males that have the highest level of these danadins, and the more she takes in, it prevents more of the beetles or predators from eating their eggs. So what type of pheromone do you think these danadins are? in this case. My rule of thumb is it deals with reproduction, so it's probably priming. It's a priming type of interaction. Let's look at another pheromone. Here we have fire ants. They leave a trail for food. It's very volatile. It can blow away within a few minutes if needed. Um, the ants will replenish it as long as the food source is there. They, they use chemoreceptors on their antennae to follow this food trail. They also have some other pheromones as well, like alarm, cleanup, and things like that. What type of pheromone do you think that is? Well, it's not reproduction, so it's a good chance. And we haven't used this one yet, so, but yeah, it, those are not good reasons to say it. But basically, we're trying to relay information. It's signaling. It's a signaling pheromone. Now, there's other types of pheromones in all sorts of others as well. So red-sided garter snakes, which I think we've mentioned before. I think those were garter snakes that we talked about in another time we were talking about associative behaviors. Uh, the spring, the male is attracted by pheromones. We they There's also a turn-off pheromone that's eventually emitted by the, I think it's emitted by the female, that says once she's made it, the other males just leave me alone pretty much. But there's also what they call she-males, and this is 
not my term. This is the term from the science. But these she-males are males. They're normal males in all ways, but they actually carry the female pheromone on their skin. And the purpose of this pheromone is that the male is given off this pheromone that says the, the female is mated, leave her alone. And so these other males get that pheromone and they're like, okay, and they leave. And so you can see the she-males have a much bigger mating success because they're getting the other males, the he-males, for lack of a better term, the ones that don't have this trait, um, don't get the chance to mate as much because the she-male is deterring them from being able to mate. It's, um, what was it we talked about in the last year? It's a type of deceit, what, is it not? So. Uh, sheep, the female only accepts her own newborn. And so a lot of times, like if you have like a lamb that you need to be fostered, what they'll do is they'll take the milk from the mother and give it to the lamb for a few days. And that actually kind of allows the mother to then accept the lamb from another mother. In this case, it's believed that MHC, again, that major histo histocompatibility complex gene is involved because it allows them to kind of recognize that this is my offspring this isn't my offspring but this offspring is drinking my milk so it must be my offspring that's what we see kind of there mice will actually give it a choice like they do a little y maze meaning that there's this or that as a choice and so they put two mice in there they put a male mice a male mice so they put a female mouse that's identical to the male and they put a female mouse that's different from the male, the male's gonna pick the one that's not genetically identical. And I think they do this pretty regularly, pretty understood. It's believed that maybe the female urine is involved in this, that that's how they're able to recognize that MHC. But that one gene is all that has to be different and the female's gonna choose that one. He's not gonna choose the genetically identical if he has a choice. Hamsters are very solitary creatures for the most part. The females will leave pheromones when they're in estrus and it'll attract the males. The males will follow these, sometimes a good little distance, and they mate and she forces the male away. And it's found that the pheromone here, this is just a chemistry teacher in me, it's dimethyl disulfide. So I thought that was kind of interesting that it's dimethyl disulfide. So CH3 to S2. Um, I guess it's methyl groups on the ends and sulfurs in the middle, kind of like a carbon chain, but it's a sulfur chain. So, yeah, um, that would make sense if I was drawing out the Lewis structure of it. But I digress. Sorry. Um, nerding out there for a second. Uh, VNO is the vomero nasal, I, I'm goofing that up, organ. Um, it's a mechanism for detecting pheromones. It looks kind of like a cigar. It's got a cigar shape. You find this in rodents. You find this in snakes. But snakes actually have what's called the Jacobson's organ. So it's very similar, but not exact same thing. And it's not just for pheromones. With snakes, they have to stick their tongue out and flick it back, and they bring the pheromone chemical in and then apply it to the um, Jacobson's organ. So the snakes, the, the tongue flicker in is very information gathering for snakes. Lots of amphibians, reptiles, mammals are able to detect these priming pheromones, pheromones, I don't know why I said it that way, by means of the VNO. Uh, neural wiring to the main olfactory, it's different wiring than the main olfactory system. Um, and it's just specialized for non-volatile. Volatile, if you're not familiar with, in chemistry means that it's a chemical that easily evaporates. So some chemicals are non-volatile. Uh, salts are non-volatile. They don't evaporate and go away. Things like alcohol, like rubbing alcohol, if you smell it very easily. Ammonia as well, because they are volatile. They evaporate easily. So these, these pheromones are preferably non-volatile, like they're not going anywhere. They're usually heavier, bigger molecules. We could get into the chemistry of pheromones, but even as a chemistry teacher, I don't want to really get into that level of detail. I just want you to know the general gist of a lot of this stuff. Most of you, if, especially if you have a cat or maybe even a dog, but cats do this a little bit more often, or maybe if you have a horse, you may have seen this motion called Fleming. And this is, you you see it in this image. This is a terrible slide. I hate this. Our cats used to do it all the time, and I hated it when they did it. But they make this grimace. And so they open, they leave their mouth open. They pull back their teeth a little bit. It almost looks like a snarl, but it's not a snarl. And they, it's, I don't know, I guess like the lion's kind of almost got his eyes closed. And a lot of times it's like they do close their eyes. Maybe they're concentrating on trying to figure out exactly what that scent is. But they'll curl back the upper lip, reveal the gums. And what this does is it gets those chemicals to the VNO and their body can 
um, figure out what this is. You see this a lot of times when animals are in heat or they smell, come across urine or something like that, and this is how they interpret that smell. Um, I think humans have this to some extent, but not really like others. Human pheromones are much more complex. There's not a lot of evidence for a VNO in humans. It's thought that it degrades quickly in the fetal development. It's most likely we're going to see pheromones from scalp, genitals, feet, armpits, you know, areas where we sweat for the most part. That's where we're going to have most of our scent. You know, that's part of the reason why we put on deodorants because we do put off scent in that respect. Mother-infant recognition, um, over the first six weeks of life, there's increase in preference for the mother's breast from the newborn. When blindfolded, two-thirds of moms could actually identify their own child versus a stranger. You know, people talk about that new baby smell, but there is something there to, again, allow for that kin recognition. Adults can actually recognize their own and kin odors on clothes. Uh, menstrual cycles work. You know, we've talked about menstrual synchrony before where women together tend to menstruate at the same time. Uh, females who apparently regularly saw men, and I'm thinking that means what they think what it sounds like, they had the shortest and most regular cycles. Um, I don't know if it's just visually seeing them or what, but hopefully maybe just that. Uh, follow up by Preddy, um, axillary sw sweat from regular cycling women were collected and then they allowed volunteers to smell it and then they started cycling on the same sweat. So really, you know, there is some synchrony there. And this kind of goes back into those polygonous ideas of females together. There was also, if male sweat was applied to the noses of females with long cycles, it was shifted to 29-day cycles, and the pheromone was unknown. So they, And there's been a lot of things that have done with this. There was a commercial, I think, I'm pretty sure it was a commercial for, like, sure deodorant, where it showed these women, and, and you see here they're in lab coats, and this drawing of it going around and smelling to see if they're if the deodorant worked like you know and it didn't i think the idea was that they couldn't smell anything and that's why they were able to get so close because the deodorant was just that good and you could do that as well but there's no known sex attractants in humans we do believe pheromones have something to do with it but there's nothing that's truly ever been recognized and found out. And if it has, it's probably a well-guarded secret. I could see people like probably say, well, no, we don't want to have that out there in the general public's knowledge. But that's what we see going on there. I have heard, and I don't have this on the slide here, but I have heard people say that for women, that especially if they're going to get married to a guy, they in order to, one way they can know that he's the right one is that if they're on birth control, and I know a lot of women take birth control for regulation of their periods and things like that. They do it for a lot of health reasons too. Um, but if you get off of the birth control, because it, it messes with your hormones, that the guy may start to smell different and to the woman. And I've you know, I've, and so that would actually kind of let you know if you're compatible or if you're not compatible just by smell because he may smell different once you're off birth control, um, if you're a female and you're on birth control. But that actually apparently does have an effect, and some people have sworn by it. I think it takes several weeks for that to get out of your system and for you to be able to tell a difference, but, you know, if that's, I don't know, there's a lot of, I mean, granted, this is more of an anecdotal type thing than a research-based thing, but it, it's worth thinking about and talking about. And you know what? We're done with this section, so it's just going to be the one video. If I can find some other video clips to put into the playlist, I will. There are some that are out there. Um, I just don't have them put into the slides at the moment, but um, yeah, so there are there are some great videos out there for pheromones, but a lot of times they go with other stuff. So anyway, I will stop here, and I'll see you in the next section.